<clears throat> I should just let it go at that. That sounded, sounded pretty good. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I would like to get out of the light, but, but I'd like to uh, move fairly quickly through an argument, um, primarily linking form and the, the form with urban intention. Um, there is, is so much analysis being done on the city today, and it's fantastic. Uh, the resources that we have available are extraordinary. But the relationship of that analysis to action through form is uh, lacking. Uh, if not altogether missing. Um, I think the, the need to move from analysis into concrete proposals uh, is more urgent uh, than it has ever been. And um, uh, uh, particularly because of the problems, uh, the environmental problems that we're facing today. Um, this is where I'm from. Um, you can see that, it's Houston. Uh, this big swollen artery that cuts through five units per acre uh, on the western part of the city uh, is a form of, of urbanism which is over. It's already a dinosaur. Um, it um, uh, has no ability uh, to um, take us into the future. Um, it, it cannot take us into the future. Um, uh, the fact that um, uh, ur uh, Houston is an extreme case, uh, only underscores the fact that this is the way we've been developing for the last 50 years in North America, at an average rate of five units an acre. Uh, with that kind of dissipation, uh, we know, um, uh, we know uh, alternatives to it are needed. Um, one of the biggest problems of climate change, and it's strange to be in, I should should say it's strange to be in, in Vancouver, um, in Houston, I have to sort of stand on my head to get people to even accept the, the, the basic facts of climate change. I don't expect that to be the case here. Uh, the argument that you see up on the board uh, uh, related to the, the problem, the two degrees Celsius is the maximum temperature that we can endure, uh, surf rise in temperature, temperature that we can endure, the 565 gigatons of CO2 is the maximum we can put into the, the atmosphere um, and keep it below two degrees. Um, uh, the amount of unburnt CO2 that we have is five times what we're, we can uh, put into the atmosphere. And to keep below uh, the two degree surface warming, uh, the requirement for 75% per capita reduction in energy consumption in the US, in this environment that you're seeing here, is gonna be required. That's a staggering, staggering number that usually sends people back to their, their uh, phones or other preoccupations. Um, what we have uh, attempted to do in the last couple of years is really very simple, uh, which is to ask the question, what would a city with a 75% or 80% per capita reduction in energy consumption look like? We think if we show an image of a city, show a solution among many, that it can, can in some ways raise the profile of the problem. Uh, that we can begin to see ways forward uh, into tackling uh, this uh, um, uh, crisis. Um, the problem is often, there, there are two parts of the problem I'd like to lay out. The first is that the, the pie chart on the bottom, uh, buildings emit 40%, 7% of CO2. Uh, transport, 28%. Both of those are really in the city, as is much in industry. Um, cities are the focus of carbon emissions. There is no solution outside of cities. A, any path to response needs to go through the city. Um, it's it's uh, given 80% uh, per capita reduction uh, being required. Um, uh, uh, we're clearly talking about lifestyle changes, right? 
the way our, our, our cities are structured and the kinds of energy expenditures that they require from us. Uh, so in, in many ways, the image here of, of the, the freeway cutting through uh, sparse urban development um, uh, is, seems like it's locked us in to a, a kind of, 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 of a high degree of expenditure uh, for the foreseeable future. However, those of us who study cities, I imagine those of uh, all of you in the room, uh, we know that cities evolve, they change, they're on cycles. In other words, this, we are not locked in to a, a, uh, an in, uh, urban infrastructure that requires uh, ener unsustainable energy consumption. Uh, most of what the, the work that we've been doing recently has been trying to make, a, make clear and make apparent that, that um, uh, cities, as cities evolve over time, uh, there is an inherent solution to the problem uh, of, of uh, climate change. Uh, like Sarah mentioned, uh, density is really, as we've done our research, research density is really the key um, uh, to this. All empirical, empirical and and non-empirical research suggests that in the in uh, the United States, anyway, uh, Manhattan is clearly the greenest city there is uh, in terms of energy consumption. Um, the lack of of, of private automobiles. Uh, the small spaces that keep us from accumulating so much, the relatively large buildings, which are energy efficient, all add up to density being the key um, uh, to uh, making the drastic cuts in uh, per capita consumption that are needed. Um, that pointer, this is um, energy consumption in the US. This is energy consumption worldwide which is when you factor in um, global populations, which is where we really need to be uh, to keep the planet at two degrees of surface warming. Um, European cities are double that, right, in that zone. And uh, obviously, um, the US cities double that again. The one interesting note is the, the, line here, which is Hong Kong, not surprisingly. Um, Hong Kong is the only modern city uh, that I know of that actually fits within the environmental footprint that we need to uh, keep uh, surface warming down to two degrees. Um, when we say density is the key, however, we have a problem is that we don't have a contemporary model of, of urban density, at least not one that is largely acceptable to us uh, as, as urban designers. Uh, what we do know is if density is in our future, we're not just gonna heap buildings onto little grids, which is what uh, is going on in Man is, has made Manhattan our, our signature dense environment. Um, uh, this was something that was pointed out, oops. in 1935 by Corbusier in this outrageous diagram that he drew of, of replanting Detroit, of replanting Manhattan um, uh, as a series of radiant city towers that replaced the congestion of the uh, superblocks being built uh, in Midtown uh, when he visited it. Um, it is in some ways the, uh, a nightmare uh, scenario. It's always been presented as such, but it's also a, a fact of, 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 of what, what we are th faced when we're thinking about looking at urban density today, which is that we cannot think of, of density as just heaping up of buildings. We have to think of a model of, of density that combines it with open space, hand in hand, a model that produces urban density and open space. Um, and to do that, you really, to sort of figure out what this model should be like, you have to go uh, into the DNA of the contemporary city. 
Um, and this is where form already enters into the, the equation. Um, this is our world today. We often think that this is our world, that the gridiron is urbanism. Uh, uh, but the, the way we, we make cities change drastically in the midpoint of the last century, where we move from an urban continuous street and block structure to a much larger scale um, suburban uh, spine-based cul-de-sac structure, uh, even in, even in uh, a city like Vancouver. Uh, this has been the mode of development. This is the urban diagram that we've been working on for the last 50 years. Um, the problem as it, we move into the future is that what's inside the circle is rapidly proportionally shrinking. What is gridded in American cities today is less than 25% of the built environment. 75% of the built environment is this stuff is the discontinuous cul-de-sac construction. What we tried to do is to, number one, take the chip off our, off our shoulders and see suburban development not as suburban, uh, but as another form of urbanism. And, and in some ways, attempt to work with that uh, as a legitimate mode of organization uh, that constitutes the city, the city that we've built over the last 50 years. Um, this is with my point of departure. This is a diagram by Ludwig Kilbersheimer, the urbanist uh, who is often associated with Mies van der Rohe, um, who thought through a transformations, uh, urban transformations in Chicago. He, he actually worked in the South Side, which was undergoing a major transformation. And what he observed was the, and what he, in the form of a proposal, was that the urban fabric was transitioning to a series of discrete figural spine forms, uh, which is, is um, Sarah mentioned, uh, I, I took on in the book uh, Ladders, uh, as a form of urban organization. This, in some ways, is very familiar to us. Uh, we know that the suburbs look like this. We know that our cities look like this. Um, however, as this is not reproduced and this is reproduced like crazy, this becomes our, our prevalent urban pattern. It is the basis upon which we need to produce a model of uh, urban density. Um, that transition is significant for a number of reason, reasons and to just briefly, quickly go through it, the, as we move from continuous streets and blocks uh, and the metropolis, the grid-based metropolis, to the super blocks of the mid 20th century, as we see the, the grid being uh, cut and larger and uh, streets, boulevards being overlaid. Los Angeles is good, a good example of this. To the contemporary subdivision, we see a, a transformation in the little diagrams below as well as we see a, 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 a segregation and an isolation. Um, and the, I would say the privileging of the individual over the collective subject in this form of urbanism. Just to make the point clear, the, these two uh, diagrams represent the same scale, even though I've shown them in different sizes. On a grid, you have an infinite connection between 13 points, uh, which are the small circles. If you talk to a mathematician, uh, it's approaching infinity. Uh, how many ways that you connect that point to that point? As opposed to in a spine-based system, uh, also known as a traffic hierarchy, there's only one connection between point A and point B. We know this, you guys know this, uh, that the differences between spine-based and grid-based urbanism are profound. And they're not just at the level, they do not just e exist at the level of traffic management. Uh, oftentimes we seem perfectly happy to have our cities designed by traffic engineers. Uh, yet the implications of, of what traffic engineers produce are obviously quite profound. The greatest of which is the way that the, the, the 
uh, spine-based urbanism focuses uh, on the individual and releases the individual from the collective uh, ambitions of the city. This is a little diagram that's again from that, that old book. Um, uh, it's a, a, a spiraling path. It's not really a form. Uh, it's based on the latter form. And I can just, uh, if you'll, you'll suffer this, uh, read uh, very quickly um, uh, a description of this path. It's to a specific place in the cul-de-sac city will always terminate in an exclusive destination or endpoint. The path on the open grid, on the other hand, will never terminate because the gridiron is infinite in all directions. As opposed to the cul-de-sac's termination of movement, the grid offers only a, a series of arbitrary stopping points that are often described as coordinates in space. For example, 239 East 339th Street. The organizational logic of an open grid produces points that are connected by an infinite number of circuits or loops. That's what you are looking at right here. Um, uh, the organizational logic of the cul-de-sac produces, on the contrary, a distribution of terminals. Um, in the cul-de-sac city, the pattern of movement through urban space traces the figure of a discrete spiral through a succession of overlaid structural hierarchies. The paths begin, this path, this, this orange path, begins on a primary urban freeway and from there turns inward towards a singularly defined place, this in-turning spiraling path from freeway to feeder to collector to development spine to driveway forms the trajectory of a closed urban system. Turning inward upon itself, the path uh, configures a series of discrete segments, each more exclusive than the last. Everyone now lives not on an anonymous grid coordinate, but at the end of a particular path on the last driveway, on the last cul-de-sac in a city whose overall form is unknowable. In the cul-de-sac city, we are right where we have always wanted to be, at the very origin of the spiral, each of our own delicate egos seated at the base of a headlong downward implosion, a terminal destination. Um, uh, it is not a coincidence that the form of urbanism that we've produced over the last 50 years privileges the individual. All aspects of our society over the last 50 years have been geared towards privileging the individual. It crosses politics. You can say this is neoliberalism uh, and be not far off the mark. Uh, but it also, in terms of the large conurbations that we're living in today, um, a suggestive way of, of uh, locating and pin ourselves, pinning ourselves down in an overall uh, urban condition that knows no boundaries, that is infinitely extensible. Uh, the point, I think, is to think through this as professionals, not with a chip on our shoulders, but to see what are the advantages of this, why has it become, why has it, it turned out this way, and in what extent does it actually, this type of urbanism, reflect who we are? I think the larger question is how could it not reflect who we are? It's what we build. Um, this is a, a, a second project by, by Hilbersheimer, which were always diagrammatic like this, where he replanned Rockford. Again, a kind of horror story, where you turn a, a gridiron city like the center of Vancouver into a cul-de-sac city like the periphery of Vancouver. And you could, and probably would, if you found this in a book, dismiss it instantly as a bad, bad idea. Um, uh, it's important to understand what Hilbersheimer was after. One of the things that he was after was, was thinking through the city uh, as, as part and parcel of the urban environment in which it sits. He actually imagined the city as a kind of organism. So what you've got is a transformation. This is the central city founded on the ford of the Rock River, obviously, Rockford. Um, which is, is completely ignorant of the fact that it's in a linear river, river valley. It's in, ignorant of the fact that it's in a, along a river at all. What Hilversheimer's transformation does is attempt to integrate the city into the ecology of the river, the riverine ecology, and of the, the valley in which it sits, such that it uh, functions almost as an organism within that larger natural environment. Uh, this is where environmental, environmentalism really 
in an interesting way intersects urban culture. Uh, not green roofs. Green roofs are great. Um, you know, electric cars are great. But how do we rethink the city in a way, in a larger sense, that the, the, what we make is actually integrated part and parcel, part of a network of the larger natural forces in which the city exists? Um, there's a lot to say about this project. Um, which I don't have time to say, but just to suggest that there is a way to connect that ambition, uh, which I think is fairly clear, uh, even though the, the, the way it's played out has been less than, than the, the way that Hilbersheimer imagined it, um, it still follows the pattern. And I think what, what's interesting is some of the ideals that drove this that drove the desire to integrate the city into its natural, uh, with its natural systems, is still resident in the way that, that we've actually built. This is a street, a fraction of a section of the street uh, grid uh, outside of Houston, FM 1960, and you see the, the fragmentation of the grid, obviously the ladders, you see the, the river, in the way that the ladder pulls back and allows space to enter in and to accommodate the, uh, the riverine infrastructure. There is good and bad in all of these things. There are lessons to take from it which are valuable and I think we need to learn these lessons in order to move uh, to a, a more comprehensive urban model. Uh, one that will actually will take us into uh, the next century. Uh, one more twist on the ladder theme which is a, 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 a wild one and probably a silly one, uh, but one that's worth, worth thinking about, is that, that the fundamental organization of the, of the subdivision uh, is not unlike the fundamental organization of the, uh, what we mostly refer to as radiant city housing or the housing estate. Uh, this is yet another extreme version, the opposite extreme of, of um, Houston, uh, which is Hong Kong, and these uh, uh, enormous housing estates that they build there. Um, uh, and the, the reciprocity, the, the, the connection between the, the terrestrial organization that focuses on the individual, that privileges the individual, that produces open space, that attempts to integrate uh, into its environment. The reciprocity between that horizontal organization and the vertical organizations that we see is again not an accident. It's not something that, that uh, just happens to be. They're similar patterns. Uh, they're identical patterns of organization. If you don't know Hong Kong, that's a very big building. Uh, the scale of Hong Kong is, is extraordinary. It's a hyperdensity, uh, which is one of the reasons that we were looking at it. And one of the reasons we've gone to Hong Kong, the one, one of the reasons we've taken housing estates, um, which is duplicate buildings, buildings built in quantity, uh, mass housing, mass produced housing, um, uh, uh, seriously, and why we've researched it for, for quite some years uh, in terms of trying to understand what might uh, uh, be a, a, a model for us to look at uh, as we move forward um, uh, uh, with urban development in the, the 21st century. To wit, um, we have um, two projects that I would like to quickly show you um, uh, that, that have tried to take some of the lessons that we've, we've learned from the urbanism of the last 50 years. Um, and, and try to draw from the ideals of that urbanism, try to connect to the intentions, uh, which were, you know, if, if anything, those of you who know recent urban history know that what really drove the Garden City movement, what, what, what drove Corbusier's production of the Radiant City was this intense desire to, to interrelate the city with nature, with natural forces. However, those attempts have turned out. Uh, the, the desire, the I ideal uh, 
the reconciliation between urban and natural sy uh, systems is actually at the root of uh, urban history over the last century. Um, uh, we tried to take, take, take these, which we, which we find to be an incredibly valuable asset. Um, uh, and in some ways we can take that ambition and that ideal out of their suburban context, whether it's the housing estate or the single family tract house, and try to think them through af uh, afresh using the spine as the, as the basic DNA that we're operating off of. So project number one is a, something, is a project that we were funded for by um, uh, all irony intended, the Shell Center for Sustainability. Um, uh, uh, they gave us a good chunk of money to redevelop a section of Houston which is in horrible conditions. It's essentially a third world city existing within in, um, the city limits directly adjacent to downtown. I don't think you have that condition in Vancouver. Um, uh, and, and redevelop it in a way that by the, the end of its redevelopment, it hits that target number that keeps us below 2% to uh, 2 degrees of warming. In other words, high density uh, development. How do you go about doing that? The first thing is to recognize these cycles. Um, the two cycles, the 550, um, it's probably true in Canada that, that um, populations move through buildings much quicker than we think. Uh, that the average term of residency in the United States is something like two and a half years for rentals and eight years for, for uh, home ownership. Uh, very quick turnover. Um, uh, it's a cycle that we average it out to five years that we think is pretty important to pay attention to. One of the things I'd like to, to um, point out and point out when I go into areas like this and talk about their future is that cities do not belong to a single generation. I'm all for participatory planning, right? That we can engage, and we did, we engaged the community in this process. Um, God knows they needed it. But the point when you think of, when you understand cities, you know that, that, that they change very slowly. Um, cities, are, um, cities aren't just malleable stuff. They have characteristics and qualities, and one quality that we often overlook is their duration. Cities are like sea turtles or sequoia trees. They have much longer lifespans. So Houston is 170 years old. It's a baby, right? It's a baby city. Um, uh, you have to put that time perspective uh, uh, into play in design, especially in participatory design, and understand that, that cities uh, do not belong to a single generation. Um, they belong to multiple generations, and if you actually look at population turnover, those generations are intergenerational, right? Every five years, uh, even 10 years. The second cycle, which we insist on, is the cycle of, of, that I started out with by saying that cities uh, evolve over time. They rebuild, constantly rebuild, build and rebuild themselves. That's what a city is. Uh, in the United States, the average lifespan of a building is less than 50 years. We were being generous and we gave it a 50-year lifespan, meaning that if you build a building um, today, uh, it will be replaced in 50 years. That seems pretty, pretty obvious and apparent. Um, what, what, we, what we asked ourselves at the beginning of this process and I can just go ahead, if you look at the bubble and show you the end of the process. Um, what, we, what we did was a thought experiment. We asked the question, if the city is rebuilt in 50 years, imagine you're standing on the street in this area called the Fifth Ward. Uh, 50 years from now, every building has been rebuilt in the last 50 years. And the question is, how did we do? We re just rebuilt the city. How do we do? Do we do a good job? Did we do what we needed to do? Did we solve the problems we needed to solve? Did we even imagine what we needed to do? Uh, this is really a, a process of imagination. How do we imagine a city, as I said at the beginning, that 
actually hits the, the, the mark of an 80, 75% per capita reduction in energy consumption. This will never be built. Its value is not as a blueprint. Its value is in, in demonstrating it's in val uh, that, that potential. It's demonstrating what we can do in 50 years, even if the processes uh, are not um, available to us at this particular moment in time. Um, and what we want to do is put the city into the carbon cycle. Um, this is actually, I put the wrong diagram in here, which I apologize for. What we have is an intermediate cycle, which is the cycle of, of um, tree, of, of plants, of the landscape. Um, and what we want to do is put the, the city into the carbon cycle. Uh, and the way we're doing it is, is this. Um, as you know, wood is a block of, maybe not know, wood is a block of carbon storage. It's very, 50% of its weight is carbon. It's an incredibly efficient carbon storage. It's, a, it's directly connected to the best carbon collector in, in the world, which is a tree. Uh, it uh, pulls um, all these whacked out schemes for geoengineering, you know, seeding the clouds with sulfur to reflect light and back out into the, the galaxy is, um, would be crazy if they weren't being proposed by Nobel laureates. But nevertheless, uh, there are other ways to think about not only conserving energy and cutting our, our energy consumption, but actually remediation. How do you sequester carbon? After you sequester it, what the hell do you do with it? Uh, right now, the, the prevailing wisdom is, is pumping it underground. We want, to, we want to, instead of store carbon underground, we want to store it in a chunk of wood and build out of that piece of wood to preserve it. Uh, the carbon will stay in wood as long as it's not burnt uh, and as long as, as um, uh, it doesn't rot or decay. One of the things we do when we make buildings is we keep material from decaying. Um, so what we're talking about is a, a, a cycle, uh, which is not literal, uh, but um, in some ways begins to put the pieces of the city into the carbon cycle. So you have uh, tree plantations, um, and we did some really wonderful research in tree plantations, and different tree species and their rates of sequestration. Um, and then we did a, another, another area of research uh, that had to do with wood construction, which you know a lot about here in Vancouver, uh, mostly because of the work of David Green, um, um, thinking through the problem of high-rise mass construction uh, in wood, uh, cross-laminated timbers. Uh, we're trying to make a, a complete suggest, promote a, a complete material culture uh, that includes not only the, the, the buildings, but how the buildings are linked to the environment, th very simply through the, the processes of, of woodlands, trees, uh, and uh, wood construction. These all have their cycles, the 50-year cycle, the loblolly pine, which is what's common in, in uh, Houston and is, in, is a carbon suck, it's a sponge, uh, has a, a 10 to 15 year cycle. Uh, and then the, the cycle that I started with of, of people, of uh, populations moving through cities. This is the kind of, of what Bruno Latour calls an actinct network, where you're combining human, and this sounds weird, human and non-human elements into a single system. Um, and I'll maybe make that clear, a little clearer as we go on. Um, so I think I've kind of explained it uh, in concept, and I'm not going to be able to get into the research in detail, uh, or into, this is one-fifth of the project. We divided the fifth ward into separate areas, uh, created um, safe zones for buildings, uh, cores that we don't, we don't um, touch. But given that the fifth ward has about four units per acre or less right now, there's not a lot of building stock left. left. Um, the area that I want to show you is the one next to what we call a bayou, which is a river. Uh, and the little creek that the city owns that we connect to a public park, Finnegan Park. Uh, 
uh, over the process of, of transformation. Uh, this is the average, this, this is the, what the, the tree landscape looks like in Houston, the types of trees. Um, this is, yeah, percentage of trees uh, that exist in the area. And this is some of our research at the bottom. Um, this is a, a rotation. We have uh, uh, hardwood, uh, softwood, pines, and we have bamboo, and actually eucalyptus, which is a fantastic tree. Uh, uh, also grow within 100 miles of the Gulf Coast, uh, which are in the mix. And they make, because they have different uh, cycles, and I think I have a slide of that. Yeah, there it is. This is their sequestration rates. Because they have different rates of sequestration, we have different harvesting cycles, which creates a dynamic um, landscape. These are tree farms uh, in many ways. Tree farms that can mature into urban forestry, but get their start as tree farms and have their obvious value uh, as a, a potential carbon credit. Uh, if not actual construction material, they give, uh, as we move into the future, which is what this uh, project is attempting to do, uh, anticipating a mature carbon market, which is only a matter of time. Um, um, uh, will uh, prove its value. Uh, what we're trying to do is leverage off of redevelopment, uh, trying to replace the slums and replace them initially with this uh, wood tower, first wood tower, uh, is what we're trying to do is leverage off of redevelopment uh, the beginnings of a plan that will play out in the future in the context of a uh, functional carbon market. As we know, as you may not know, but architects in here may know, um, steel and concrete are the two of the deep, two most dirtiest industries. Just to produce concrete, it's the second dirtiest industry in terms of carbon emissions. Once a carbon market occurs, the price of concrete will go through the roof and the price of wood will drop dramatically. Uh, not only because of its production value, uh, that there's no very little emission in, in producing wood as a building material. But also, and to us more importantly, um, thinking of wood as a literal block of carbon storage, it changes the way we think of wood. And to overstate the case uh, that, we're, that we want to make, um, I think wood will have an impact on the architecture in the 21st century comparable to the impact that concrete had on the 20th century. Um, this is um, the plantation cycles. The project comes in 10-year increments and the, the existing buildings phase out as their life phases out. Um, there's not that many buildings left. We preserved, this is the preservation area, the, what we call the holdout. Uh, in the middle around which this new organization is built. Those are the rates, and this is the really wonderful effects of cross-laminated timber construction, uh, which I could, could go into, but you can look it up on the web yourself. You can build a, a SOM has engineered a 40-story tower completely out of wood, including the, the um, uh, core the elevator cores with very little supporting uh, material. It's a, it's a kind of fantastic um, uh, application of technology. We think that, that for all the deficiencies of the large scale of urban production that we need, to, that we have today, let's say super blocks, let's say housing estates, the, the raw brutality and big scale of the housing estate that this in some ways resembles. Much of the, the problem with that is overcome in itself just by using wood as a predominant material. So you can see in the, the project that, the, that, we're, that it's pervasive, that it's it wood in various states and forms. Um, uh, it is an attempt in some ways to make a material culture which is a kind of quaint word that anthropologists use. 
right, that we can actually build a culture out of a single material uh, like the Scandinavian cultures uh, once had. And this is the proper diagram, which shows the, the 50, even though it's kind of ugly, it shows the 50-year cycles uh, embedded within those are the, the cycles of the landscape. Embedded in those are the cycles of the population, uh, which make up this comprehensive network. Uh, this is a wishful rewilding of the bayous. This is what a bayou actually looks like uh, in Houston. Uh, the forms I can are, are, are um, I can uh, explain in the second project the the way we 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 uh, uh, go about. Uh, producing the forms and how we think about urban typology. This is the bayou presently. This is a dent. This is has some density. It's kind of not a well-framed picture. <clears throat> it's the opposite of the picture that I started out with the freeway in the the, the uh, beginning. What we need in a model of urban density today is a model of density that combines open space openness with density and not just piling density, building on top of building on top of building. Um, so the, the network that runs through Houston we're proposing, and it actually exists as a public network, uh, despite Houston's rep, rep, reputation, it has 150 continuous miles of linear park along these bayous, which we see as the anchor, the spatial anchor uh, for a new high density development in the city. At least, that's what it could be, <laughs> right? Um, we're, trying to, we're, not, we're trying to show what we can do in those 50 years. We're trying to show a future that while it's unlikely to ever come about, um, uh, uh, needs to be shown and understood as, as, as a possible path forward. Uh, as opposed to the stasis that we that exists now, the lack of action on the climate problem. Second project is an extension of the first, uh, which we just finished, and it's a little bit, bit messed up uh, graphically. Uh, you can bear with me. It's for the Biennale, and we were given a site, the the Venice Biennale, uh, which goes on display this summer. Um, <coughs> The, uh, Biennale, the theme of the Biennale is rebuilding Detroit. Um, how, how many times have we, we tried to do that? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we were given a site with 10 other people in different parts of the city uh, and were asked mostly to respond to it. Um, it's an area called Court Town, if you know uh, Detroit, just west of downtown, uh, which has been cut off from the rest of the city by freeways um, and uh, pretty much a, a, a transformation based on the one that I just just uh, uh, talked to you about that has a, uses a model that combines open space with high density uh, in a manner of radiant city but in a manner that, that I think is it produces um, uh, much more more livable outcomes. Uh, we were really fortunate. The reason I really wanted to do this project is because of Lafayette Park, which is fantastic. Thank you. I have two minutes. Um, the Mies and Hilbersheimer um, project in Detroit, which has grown, if you haven't seen it, it's grown to be a beautiful project. Um, it needed that 50 years. It needed, needed the time uh, to become what it is. At any rate, we use that. And we, 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 we proposed a, a stage transformation. No one's thrown out, no buildings that are viable or torn down. Uh, we staged this over 10 years. Cities evolve, right? This is not master planning. This is not tabula rasa stuff. So this is our evolution. It just so happens, and we build up much higher densities than we did in, in um, uh, Houston. Um, uh, to try to get, get the, the mass transit density to get us into larger, more efficient buildings um, and to see an alternative for Detroit 
Um, I haven't seen many positive futures for Detroit. We were trying to provide one, however controversial this one would be. Um, and to, and the, it just so happens that in Detroit there is a, something called Haunts Woodlands. They're planting out, uh, uh, I think, a thousand blocks with sugar maples as a way of banking the land. Um, this is for the architects, and I don't have time to go into it, but um, we've, we understand the need for typology, which has been pretty much reject, rejected in architecture schools because we have a very limited definition of what type is. We tried to expand that definition by coming up with these matrix of variable forms, which we call a search space, where through very simple manipulations, you have a series of related forms, within the search space, any given area, I know this is arcane looking, uh, any given area is, is unified because they're all brothers and sisters. They're related to each other in terms of these stage transformations. I can talk to you about that later if you, you want to know information, more information about it. We have to have typology very, for the very simple reason that the definition of a city is a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. Right? If you, if you just have a field of buildings, you don't have a city. You just have a field of buildings, and we've seen enough of that. Uh, you have to, in some ways, extract synergies out of those buildings. The whole has to be greater than the sum of the individual parts. We need typology. But the old typologies of these platonic forms, right, um, the or of more recent typologies like uh, that, that have been attempted uh, are too limited. Simple platonic um, slab, tower, uh, shed. Um, our programs are much too complex for that. And this is trying to respond to that complexity by actually making a hybrid of the, of the tower, the shed, and the slab. Again, testing out densities of that model this, I believe, is 2000. Oh, shit, I don't have the date on it. Uh, this is early in the early stage of process. Um, maybe the fourth or fifth generation to move through with a lot of planting and not much building. Buildings around new subway stops, the new mass transit system. Uh, study models showing the, the um, uh, landscape the plantation slash urban forest, the trees changed in Detroit. A later phase, we were asked just to do two blocks, which are these two blocks. Uh, we did 250 blocks because we think the idea that you could just build on two blocks and that would transform the entire area uh, is, not, uh, well, is not realistic. Uh, we're not building the Pompidou in Paris Right? We can't, you can't reform an urban environment simply by building a, a signature building within it, not when there's no buildings around it. That's why we took on the entire landscape. Um, this is the, the building which we did focus on because we are adamant about connecting architecture to urbanism. One of the worst things, aspects of postmodernism, is it is is it dropped off, and you know it. If those of you who are architects in here, uh, it's disconnected modern architecture from modern urbanism. Um, more than anything, I think to the, to connect those two back up again um, uh, is something is probably the, the the most important thing that's driving one of the most important things that's driving this research and it's wood construction. And this is the final phase. It's a um, uh, hotel, residential, commercial, mixed use, uh, office space, commercial, small uh, appendage to the, um, to the um, convention center. And this plaza, that, this upper level plaza that overlooks a, a river And that's it. Thank you very much.
do I have time to, or to take questions or are we out of time? Huh? One question. Is there a burning question? I have microphones here. A thousand. There's one in the back there. You made an excellent point about the uh, uh, relationship between the terminal paths in our current constructions and individuality, or that identity. Don't you see that as a fundamental problem of separation that we really need to get so that we realize we're part of? Yeah, um, I, I, I think there are, uh, sort of, that's the uh, kind of fulcrum of the argument is that you, you zeroed in on it. Um, I think that, that uh, the separations, um, because they exist, because the transformations of the middle of the, t the 20th, in the middle of the 20th century all push towards individuation, uh, we know we're part of that process. And we know there's a reason to do it. And we know all of us in this room cherish that individuality, right? It's part of who we are. Um, and we know that it's not enough uh, in itself. Um, I think one of the important things to recognize, uh, at least in the North American context, is that we never would have built this environment. Um, uh, we never would have, have, have done cul de sac had it not been for automobiles, televisions, and telephones. <laughs> that there's an overlay of virtual connectivity that we're now seeing the full flowering of in the, in the um, digital obsessions that we all have. Um, uh, and I, I think there's, I, I, the, the simple answer to your question is that I think that discontinuous urbanism can also be public. There can be bad and alienating grid urbanism, right? And there can be good and engaging or enfranchising urbanism uh, in, uh, on the spine. In other words, I think there, there, we aren't limited. There's a difference between a spine-based urbanism and a grid-based urbanism. And you can, you can produce and promote a collectivity on a spine base. But I, I think it requires that we understand the spine base, understand how, why we privilege individuality and actually respect it. And, and acknowledge it. There's so many, uh, well, I'm not gonna go there. Um, uh, I, at least that's the hope. And I, I, I see that as a kind of professional, I approach that as a kind of professional obligation. You look at these two different types of urbanism objectively because we're professionals, instead of just blowing it off and say the suburbs suck and I'm gonna live in the city um, and I'm only gonna do projects in the city. Right, which is what, for example, my school does. Um, uh, it is to it is in some ways unprofessional, certainly unobjective, to think that there's only one way to make a spine city, and it's always alienating. And one of the reasons we we go to Hong Kong is to see versions, alternative, extreme alternative versions of spine-based urbanism that actually do create a public, have a public dimension to them, especially when you get up to these densities. Thanks. Thanks okay, for thank question. you.